Thank you, Gary. Uh, my name is Ryan Ayer, Secretary of the Book Club of Washington. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mary Schaff of the Washington State Library in Tumwater. Mary, who is originally from the Seattle area, is a graduate of the University of Washington I School, so a fellow Husky like myself. Uh, she is the Pacific Northwest Librarian at the Washington State Library, where she has worked since 2005. So she has a lot of familiarity with the collections. Uh, today, she'll be discussing the Washington State Library's history and its collections, specifically its archives. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Mary. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, thank you so much, Book Club of Washington, for this uh, really wonderful invitation. I I will gladly proselytize about the wonderful collections of the Washington State Library anytime to anyone. Um, I hope you've been enjoying this little slideshow. I, I very quickly realized that I was not going to be able to get everything I wanted to discuss in. So I went ahead and created this slideshow for you to enjoy um, you know, prior to the my main talk. But let's go ahead and get to the main talk. Hold on just a second here. All right, um, I'm really very excited to be able to share some stories and photos with you today and celebrate the books that are so deeply connected to the history of the State Library and to the history of our state. And uh, those of you who are playing along at home, you can um, almost everything I'm going to be, not the individual examples, but the topics that I'll be discussing is um, are on our website, uh, the Special Collections website. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize and offer gratitude to the indigenous peoples who have cared for this land where we are today. The Washington State Library is located in Tumwater, which is on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. We acknowledge, support, and recognize their presence here since time immemorial and their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. We are indebted to them for the many cultural resources, including books and manuscripts, produced and distributed by tribal members for the education and better understanding of all. Um, Again, my, my name is uh, Mary Painton Schaff. I've worked as a librarian at the Washington State Library for 19 years. I'm currently serving as Northwest Librarian. My experience with our special collections is born from many years of assisting our customers to access, read, and appreciate our materials. If you asked a dozen people which books to highlight today for this presentation, you would receive a dozen different answers. And, and I'd like to thank Shirley and Catherine who are here today, who could probably also testify to that. But this presentation represents my best effort to gather together items I think this group would appreciate. I'm hopeful that this presentation will generate some discussion in the chat so I can learn along with you. So please go ahead and type your questions or comments. The number of things I have to get through means I may not be able to get to all the questions during the presentation, but I will leave time for questions at the end, and I'm happy to stay and discuss further afterwards. Mary, if I could interrupt for a second, you might want to have your image. Um, we're seeing the sidebar, and you might want to have your, your image so that it's full screen. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to do that. You had it before, so. Slideshow. Boy. Hey, Mary, I think you're sharing the wrong screen. We're looking at your the the one that was uh, playing before. All right, let's see what I can do here. Um, try stop sharing and then reshare the right screen. Let's try this again. There we go. Yeah. Again, there we go. There we go. Can you see me now? Yep. Okay. We just see we see the land, land. There we go. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, no problem. Um, like I said, I'm indebted to our retired Northwest librarian and longtime book club member, um, Catherine Hamilton Wang, who's here, as well as Shirley Lewis. Um, for sharing her wisdom uh, and experience with our collections and provided me with many of the examples we'll go through today. I also want to thank my coworker Julie Thompson for assisting me with additional recommendations and for um, this, the scanned images that appear. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and skip because I can't unfortunately see your chat, but um, hopefully I can get a sense of how many of you know about the State Library or have visited, and I'll, I'll take a look at that when we, uh, when we finish up. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, the photo on this slide is of our building uh, located in Tumwater, just south of Olympia. We've been in this building since 2001, about the time when the independent agency of the State Library was administratively moved under the Secretary of State's office. Between 1958 and 2001, we were located on the Capitol campus in the Paul Theory designed Pritchard Library Building, uh, which many of you also may be familiar with. Any state agency that has existed since 1958 could be considered to have a fairly long history in our state, but the State Library was actually among the very first divisions of government created for our territory in 1853 by the Organic Act. This act of Congress established Washington Territory as a separate territory from Oregon Territory, and Section 17 of the act reads, and be it further enacted that the sum of $5,000 be, and the same is hereby appropriated out of any monies in the Treasury not otherwise appropriated, to be expended by and under the direction of the Governor of Washington in the purchase of a library, to be kept at the seat of government for the use of the Governor, Legislative Assembly, Judges of the Supreme Court, Secretary, Marshal, and Attorney of the Territory, and other such persons and under such regulations as prescribed by law. So one of the first functions of the nascent territorial government was to oversee a popu that was to oversee a population of just under 4,000 European settlers was to establish a library. This library was primarily geared towards the needs of government officials, but the materials could be and was, were used by anyone. It was the people's library from the very start. Most historians of the Pacific Northwest know about Isaac Stevens, our first territorial governor, pictured here on the right. He was a railroad surveyor, for better and worse, an Indian treaty negotiator, and a brigadier general for the Union Army during the Civil War. But few are aware of his role as the first acquisition specialist for the territorial library, a job he took very seriously, according to his son, Hazard Stevens. Stevens was appointed governor of Washington Territory on March 17, 1853, by President Millard Fillmore. And just over a week later, he also received a commission to head an expedition surveying a northern railroad route from the Mississippi to Puget Sound. His plan was to do his surveying work while en route to his new jurisdiction, but before departing, he made arrangements for the territorial library. He drew a warrant of $4,000 on the United States Treasury for his initial book purchasing on April 23, 1853. With those funds and the gift books he received through a dedicated letter writing campaign to other government officials, Stevens amassed approximately 2,000 volumes, which he had packed into Massachusetts steamer trunks for shipment to the new territory. On May 19, 1853, bookseller Charles B. Norton and company paid the invoice to ship either 32 or 23 crates, it's a little, a little conflict there of to which number, to San Francisco via the extreme clipper ship Invincible, who's shown in the artwork on the left-hand side of the screen. The Invincible was once one of the fastest ships afloat and she broke several records during her relatively short career. Her trip around the Horn from New York to San Francisco with the Territorial Library books was completed in just 110 days. Once they arrived at the port of San Francisco, the library crates were then packed aboard the brig Tarquina for travel up the coast to Olympia, Washington Territory. The books arrived October 23rd, 1853, five months after they initially left New York. They beat the arrival of Governor Stevens, who had undertaken the cross-country journey on horseback for his railroad survey, and who didn't arrive for another month. So what did Stevens buy? His son Hazard noted that Governor Stevens, in addition to being a competent military man, was also a tremendous scholar. He graduated first in his class at West Point in all subjects, including French, and his love of history, literature, and exploration are clearly seen by the book selections he made. Stevens also kept in mind that the library he was purchasing was meant to form a solid basis for white settler society, where traditional scholarly and literary resources commonly found on the East Coast would be relatively scarce. Pictured here is just one image from records of the United States General Accounting Office, miscellany, 
uh, miscellaneous treasury accounts, which document the money Stevens spent on acquiring the territorial collection and which was preserved as part of the collections of the National Archives. These records represent the authoritative provenance of the territorial collection and document with accuracy Stevens's purchase purchases for the library. Here we see one invoice to C.B. Norton dated May 14th, 1853, less than a week before the books were shipped aboard the Invincible. Uh, a couple things to note here. I'll just circle them here. The first column is uh, which case that the books were packed into. Uh, the next column shows the titles of the books and the prices that he paid. We have a running total here on this invoice of $219.25. And then the signatures of both Charles Norton and at the very bottom, Isaac Stevens. According to former Northwest librarian Hazel Mills, Stevens purchased or secured by gift 2,852 volumes between 1853 and 1855. Of these, 1,189 volumes were law books, reports, and statutes. The legal titles were transferred to the State Law Library en masse in 1921. Of the remaining general purpose titles, the Washington State Library has retained approximately 750 volumes of the original collection. And when you use our online catalog to search these materials, you can see that these 750 volumes represent 403 separate titles. Those of you who are good at math have probably made the calculation that this would appear to indicate over 900 original territorial library volumes have been lost or otherwise un unaccounted for. Certainly some of the materials would have been preserved in other formats like the bound newspapers which Stevens purchased for the collection that were eventually preserved by much more stable microfilm. However, early Olympia newspapers are full of notices from exasperated territorial librarians asking for the return of overdue books. Already by 1858, just four years after the book's arrival, the librarian advertised the Territorial Library was seeking the return of 100 missing volumes. The general sloppiness with which the borrowing records were kept led to an outraged Washington Legislative Council to demand of the librarian an accurate and complete accounting of the remaining books, which led to the creation of the library's first written catalogs. By that point, though, it was clear that some of these efforts came too late and much of the original collection was gone. So let's take a look at some of the volumes that are still present in the territorial collection. This is the oldest item in the collection and the second oldest item at the State Library. It is a series of letters by Hernando Cortez, written in Latin and published in 1524, Preclara Ferdinandi. It doesn't look that old from the outside, as it was clearly rebound sometime in the 19th century. Stevens paid $4, or about $160 in today's money, for this series of letters that in 1853 were already over 300 years old. Here you can see the new binding incorporated both part of the title and the date of the item, 1824. I mean, 1524. The inside cover shows where an old book plate has been removed and Library of the Territory of Washington has been scribbled over the top. And a more modern property sticker is in the upper left-hand corner that I would guess comes from the 1940s or so. It's hard to say. And here is the beautiful title page with its wonderful um, decorative border. You can see that the text block seems to be in fairly good condition protected by that newer binding. Here's the first page of text with a coat of arms on the left-hand side. And I wanted to show this page because I love these little guys hanging out in the corner with their little beards. They're just adorable. The protective sleeve for this book also contains this 1975 letter from UCLA librarian Wayne Ruitt to a librarian at the State Library named Thomas Mayer. In the letter, Ruitt thanks Mayer for providing him a copy of this item, which he used to compare to other extant versions. He notes that our copy had some considerable bleed through of the ink, indicating that the pages were bound while the ink was still drying. This led him to a couple of interesting conclusions. The most interesting of which I think is his belief that our volume 
was at one time bound with the court with Cortez's third letter, Tertia Fernati. On the left is the last page in our volume showing a rather interesting ghost image. I hope you can see it. It is a ghost image, so if you can't, don't be surprised. And here is the Xerox of the original uh, cover of the third letter that Ruet sent along with his note, which I think is pretty solid evidence. Those match up pretty well. Let's move on to another old volume, which shows no signs of being rebound and presents with this very old um, vellum binding. The book is in Italian and is by Benedetto Bordone, a Venetian manuscript editor and illustrator. The title translates roughly to Isolario by Benedetto Bord Bordone, in which all the islands in the world are discussed. Very modest title. The date on the title page is 1533. Here's the spine. You can see there's uh, some old writing on it that's mostly illegible at this point. That's probably a number there, 206 maybe on the top. This book is in very fragile condition. There's significant tear along the hinge, but I wanted to show you the inside cover where a written property stamp for the Territorial Library, library has been pasted over with a more modern one Although this time I'd guess that label dates from about the 20s or 30s. And here is the beautiful title page printed in both red and black ink. Bordone's expertise appears to have been maps such as this one, though most of the maps in the book appear printed on a single page. I think this is the only one I saw that spanned the width of two pages. And here's the inside back cover where it's more obvious that earlier paper with writing on it has been reused to create the cover. I've attempted to show the writing on the inside here, but it may be difficult to see. I did pull up, a, maybe that's a little easier to see the writing that's clearly on the inside there. Stevens also only paid $4 for this book. So clearly the condition of the binding didn't consider into the purchase price at all, which I don't think is true of uh, rare books anymore. We're going to just discuss one more item in the Territorial Library. Uh, this little volume has a lovely green cover, uh, but I'm fairly certain it too has been rebound, even though the text bo block dates from much later than the other two examples. The new binding incorporates a beautiful permanent call number at the bottom, 917.8G21, indicating it was rebound after the library began using the Dewey Decimal System which must have been after that system's in invention in 1876. Again, here you can see a summarized title and author printed on the spine, Journal of Lewis and Clark by Patrick Gass. Gass's journal is, uh, is of critical importance in understanding the Lewis and Clark expedition and Stevens keeping an eye out for books that explain the geography and exploration of his new territory purchased this uh, 1807 first edition of Gass's work for just 75 cents. The rebinding and text blocks show a long history of heavy use for this item, as you might expect. And here's an example of the text block for you showing some pretty heavy foxing. Before we move on, I want to highlight this one last Stevens purchase, and that's the Territorial Globes. During the 19th century, globes like this were sold in pairs, one celestial and one terrestrial. In this photo of our reading room, the celestial globe is on the left and the terrestrial globe is on the right. I did try and get good photos of the globes individually so you could see the detail, but unfortunately those protective glass cases they're in really prevent any sort of good quality image without reflections or glare. So happily, you're just going to have to come down and visit us if you want a close up view. But the Territorial Library invoices preserved on NARA's microfilm contain the original receipt, one pair of globes, 18 inches at a cost of $50.30, uh, which again, one ca inflation calculator estimated is about $1,800 in today's money. The second line is a little trickier to read, but we think it's referring to special cushioning to protect the globes during transport. The Territorial Library became the State Library once statehood was achieved in 1889, and over the years, more books and printed materials came to make their home in our collections. 
The librarians charged with the care of rare books made the point of adding older materials of interest as collectibles, but also kept an eye out for contemporary publications likely to become rare due to their scarcity. So volumes dating from the early 20th century haven't necessarily been in the custody of the state library since they were new. They could have been added much later on as a consequence of a gift or purchase from a book dealer. Let's take a look at some of the books that are old and rare, but not part of the original territorial collection. One set of items that came into possession of the State Library are these lovely, heavy, leather-bound volumes issued by the United States War Department called Reports of Explorations and Surveys to ascertain the most practicable and economical route for a railroad from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. The work that Stevens did on his surveying trip while en route to Washington Territory can be found here, along with the work of many considerable others. I love the tooling on the front cover there. Stevens was clearly very proud of his work, for he gifted several complete sets of these volumes, of these works, uh, 13 volumes in all, to various family members. This particular example in our collection was gifted to Miss Susan Stevens from her affectionate father, Isaac Stevens. This volume actually doesn't show maps or surveying, but I was intrigued by the topic, the zoology of the several Pacific Railroad routes. Zoology actually takes up three entire volumes and include uh, many wonderful illustrations like these. Here on the left, you see hooves of mule deer, um, and on the right, varieties of moles. While many of these species are no doubt new to researchers, I think the report also serves as a kind of early environmental impact statement. These railroads would be built through areas where creatures lived, and it was judged important to know which ones and how many. This is an interesting story which only came to light last year when we were contacted by Tug Boos, a historian who was following up on a paper of his that was published in Pacific Northwest Quarterly about the steamer USS Massachusetts. He was particularly interested in 11 books of ours that were inscribed with the names of L.M. Goldsboro and H.A. Goldsboro. The books that were most, these books were mostly on the subjects of mathematics and engineering uh, many of them were in French, and the books were old, dating between 1788 and 1836. Louis M. Goldsboro and his brother Hugh Allen both served in the U.S. Navy aboard the USS Massachusetts, which first visited Puget Sound in 1850 with both brothers on board. Upon his discharge from the Navy, Hugh elected to stay and try his luck in the New Territory's coal fields. He appeared to have some success in the area, but in 1863, Hugh left Washington Territory after a court case found him in debt to M.R. Tilly in the amount of over $1,500, or about $39,000 in today's money. Exactly how these books that once belonged to Hugh and his brother became part of the library's collection is currently a mystery, and Tug and I are still trying to pin down the details. Given the brothers' background and the timing of Hugh's departure, it is possible these volumes sailed around the Horn on board the Massachusetts, came ashore as the property of Hugh Goldsboro, and were gifted by him to the library before his departure in 1863. Considering the circumstances of Hugh's leaving, I suspect there's also a chance they were gifted to the library by M.R. Tilly, who could have received the books as part of the damages he was owed. Whatever the case, you can see in this volume dating from 1823, some very old water damage. Tug suggested that the water stain indicates that it's likely at some point the book was sitting in a puddle of water and the paper drew the water up in that hourglass shape out and along the spine. As someone who spent a lot of time on boats and had more than one book ruined by water damage, I really like this theory. But I will note that the Territorial Library was also housed in some very sketchy locations most notably the decrepit Territorial Legislative Building. I also think it's conceivable that a leaky ceiling once dripped water onto the top of this book and the stain was created from the top down. Anyone with expertise in book damage is most welcome to put their opinion in the chat or contact me afterwards with your thoughts. Oops. I'm gonna take a leap forward in time a bit so I can showcase some of our 20th century materials. One of our patrons made me aware of this lovely little booklet from a 1918 fundraiser during World War I for the benefit of Naval Relief Society and War Industries Hospital Fund on the University of Washington campus. 
The back cover shows just one of the many advertisements for Seattle businesses that supported the fundraiser and purchased an advertisement in the brochure. Inside the pamphlet is this marvelous 1918 map of the UW campus showing the school just a decade after the Alaska Yukon Exposi uh, Pacific Exposition of 1909. Many of the buildings from the fair have been dismantled at this point, but the map shows how the campus absorbed the ex exposition landscaping and became the school that we know today. I'm just gonna point a couple things. Here it says you can uh, take the streetcar and enter the campus that way. You might want to attend the pageant at the amphitheater. Um, over here is Jazz Trail all the time, which you can use to access the circus, continuous from 11 a.m. to midnight. And don't forget to take a look at that dirigible while you're over there. This is the interior of the program, which has lots of interesting tidbits. You could check out the water sports featuring All Navy versus Camp Lewis and water polo and swimming exhibitions, including diving and stroke demonstrations. And don't forget the jitney dances with a 25 piece band followed by a water carnival with illuminated barges and a chorus of a thousand naval sailors. I can't help but think that this must've been a real swell event. I want to highlight this title from the Seattle Works Progress Administration during the 1930s because of the gorgeous color cover. If we had time, I would highlight some of the amazing charts and graphs inside that showed logging and lumber industry statistics and what those numbers meant for the working men and women of our state. I also love the title, Trees and Men. Here's a timely publication that also demonstrates that rare items don't always have to have a leather binding or custom printing. This is a report written by Dr. Barbara Lane on the on the identity and treaty status of the Nooksack Indians. It's a typed manuscript and completely plain in presentation. However, Dr. Lane was the star witness for the tribes during the court case better known as the Bolt decision, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Dr. Lane's research persuaded Judge Bolt to side with the tribe's argument that the state had breached his treaties with them. This research and additional research like it was presented in court as evidence and is difficult to find outside of public records requests. Finally, here's an example of a very contemporary rare item, pandemic protests in Puyallup and Olympia. Photographer Paul Friedland documented a year of unrest with his camera and then published this book to document an historic and difficult time for Washingtonians. Many of his photos depict active protests like this one and numerous and the numerous photos he took of the Proud Boys and their march on Olympia. However, Paul also captured more quiet and passive photographs like this one of Gabe sitting with a sign, be thoughtful, read books, support human rights. The contrast between the two types of photographs is striking and makes for a very compelling volume that documents a, tur a very turbulent time in our state. Moving on, I wanna showcase some of the items that fall under the category of book art for all you book art lovers out there. We don't collect in this area too often, but if the topic relates to the Northwest and is book-like in format, we do purchase in this area. First is this lovely fold out paper and fabric enclosure by artist Brittany Sanders. Last night we were awoke depicts the night sky during several key nights of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Here's just one portion of the piece showing December 28, 1804. The entire work is depicted on one kind of glued together long piece of parchment that accordions out of the enclosure. And this is about half of the entire thing. It's absolutely unique and very beautiful. And what could be in this lovingly made large black walnut box with a cameo? I wonder if anyone can guess just by the image on the cameo. I bet somebody knows. It's an image of Canadian artist Emily Carr, and the work here is The Art of Emily Carr by Doris Shadbold. 
The box and its contents were a limited edition of 250 in 1980, of which our copy is number 190. Upon opening this box, we first come across several large prints of Carr's charcoal drawings, and this is one of them. The box is large enough to hold these 16 by 14 prints and the large book underneath. The, large, the cover of the book is deceptively plain, but when you open it, you discover these beautiful marbled end papers. This photo doesn't really do them justice. It's much more beautiful than this. The illustration you see here is actually a separate color print that has been tipped into the book. There are 177 of these reproductions of Carr's work tipped in, and they appear both in black and white and in color, like this one. Here you can see the tipped in image on the left and the black and white reproduction on the page on the right. This enormous book, the prints and the box are, are really just stunning in person. And my again, my photos hardly do it justice. Moving from a large folio sized item, we have this tiny box. Given its size, you may be saying to yourself, it looks like it only could fit something the size of a walnut. And you would be right. The box was custom built to house this clever little item, the Lewis and Clark Exposition in a Nutshell from 1905. No doubt a souvenir from the Portland Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition, this little walnut and its contents have beaten the odds to survive almost 120 years, in part thanks to this clever little box. When you pull the top of the title page up, tiny circular pages featuring photos from the exposition come accordion accordioning out. When we give tours at the State Library, this little item is always a favorite. I thought I would next introduce you to two of our more contemporary collections, the Governor's Writers Award, GWA, and Guy Galleon Press collections. The two collections have very different provenances and collecting guidelines, but the collections were created in similar ways by adding books from one of two methods. First, both contain books that were in circulation elsewhere at the State Library and were brought together when these two collections were formed. Second, new books were purchased specially for these collections when GAP gaps in our holdings were discovered. So some items have multiple property stamps and borrowing histories attached, and some have minimal to no processing at all. The condition varies wildly between individual books. For those items that were purchased later on, I've observed a special effort has been made to obtain clean first editions and or signed copies or other editions of note. The Governor's Writers Award collection um, traces its history back to the Governor's Festival of Arts, which began in 1966. As part of each year's festivities, Governor Dan Evans would honor resident authors of Washington, as well as the books that were created here in our state. Later on, awards were given for bodies of work in addition to single titles. The State Library would host the authors and the Governor every spring to present award certificates to the authors selected by a jury made up of librarians, authors, academics, and booksellers. Today, these awards live on in the form of the Washington State Book Awards presented by the Washington Center for the Book. This program is overseen by a state library, in particular by staff member Sarah Pate, who does just an amazing job of coordinating this effort. Among the 2023 winners of the State Book Award last year were Red Paint by Tasha Tuxiblo Lapointe of Tacoma and We Had Our Reasons poems by Ricardo Ruiz and other hardworking Mexicans from Eastern Washington. The items included in the Governor's Writers Award collection include books that were award winners as well as books that represent a winning author's body of work. The book in this, this book in the collection was a retrospective of Imogen Cunningham's pioneering work in photography, which included her early photography in Seattle but it was not the prize winner. The, that book was After 90, which won the GWA shortly after her death and was awarded posthumously in 1977. But I wanted to highlight this book because the photographs are accompanied by Cunningham's own captions, which are so clearly, you can hear them in her voice. This photo of Ansel Adams, she wrote, I did this when I was doing stills for David Myers. Ansel never used it, but he made this print. Therefore it must be good. 
I kind of like it because it shows his crooked nose. Part of the reason for the delay in honoring Cunningham's work was the general concern expressed by more conservative jury members that her early work, which included photographs of nudes frolicking on Mount Rainier, was too scandalous to reward even as a small part of a body of work. Imogen showcases one such image of her husband with her caption that reads, This was made in 1915 when I was first married. You could never chase a naked husband around Mount Rainier today. I just wanted to make sure you guys were still paying attention. Ivan Doig won the Governor's Writers Award a whopping five times, the first in 1979 and the last in 1997. Dancing at the Rascal Fair won in 1988, and the copy we have in the collection was signed by him. Murray Morgan was another multiple winner for both individual titles and for his overall body of work. Several of his works appear in the collection representing his body of work, including this lovely edition of Bridge to Russia, first published in 1947. I really love that blue-green cover. Our copy is a first edition and was signed by Mr. Morgan. A more unusual item in the collection is this French edition of Morgan's book on the Grand Coulee Dam, published in 1957 and translated by Marc Lamarin. This volume undoubtedly was a gift from Mr. Morgan because in general, the State Library does not seek out and purchase translations of work originally published in English, even for the Governor's Writer's Award. An item like this is exceedingly rare even for us but I wanted to highlight this marvelous map of Grand Coulee with all its French labels. Anne Rules, The Stranger Beside Me, her smash hit about all-American boy Ted Bundy, won the GWA in 1981. Any librarian will tell you that true crime circulates like nothing else in the library, and this is still true for a book, for, for this book 43 years later. We carry this original edition from 1981, as well as the updated 20th anniversary edition in our circulating collections as well. I would bet that at least one of those is currently checked out right now. Roger Sales' work holds a special place in my own heart since I was fortunate to have him for several classes at the University of Washington School of English before his retirement in 1999. Seattle past to present won the GWA in 1977. And he won again in 1979 for Fairy Tales and After, from Snow White to E.B. White. His literary interests were wide and varied, but this history of Seattle still stands as a foundational text for not only Northwest historians, but for chroniclers of any city. On the back end paper, Sale opted to include this early Sanborn map of Seattle, along with now, the now familiar mnemonic for remembering Seattle street names. Jesus Christ made Seattle under protest for Jefferson, James, Cherry, Columbia, Marion, Madison, Spring, Seneca, University, Union, Pike, and Pine. Sale, <clears throat> excuse me, Sale dated this useful memory tool back to the days of the Denny regrade, but he himself was widely credited with popularizing it for a modern and appreciative audience. Finally, I want to highlight this gem. Judy Geis was one of Seattle's early celebrity chefs, and the Northwest Kitchen, a seasonal cookbook, won a GWA in 1979. Here we see a photo of her with Pascalina Verde, one of her favorite green grocers at the Pike Place Market. In 1979, Pike Place Market had only just been saved from redevelopment eight year by voters eight years prior and had yet to grow into one of Seattle's preeminent tourist destinations. However, Geis is not the award recipient. Rather, a special award was given to renowned Pacific Northwest artist George Sutakawa for his gorgeous illustrations, which accompany the recipes and menus. Uh, I think you can, we can all agree that his illustrations elevate this cookbook in a way that photos of grinning chefs holding fresh produce simply do not. I love this lobster, which accompanies one menu. And here's some lovely salmon swimming upstream from a recipe of watercress and snow pea salad. 
It's no wonder that Juris created a special award just for this year to honor his efforts. Our Ye Galleon Press collection features the work of Glenn Adams and his Ye Galleon Press, which operated out of Fairfield, Washington. Ye Galleon printed regionally significant titles in the area of Pacific Northwest and local history, focusing primarily on reprints of long out of copyright titles, but also original memoirs and other stories of geographical interest. Of the approximately 600 titles issued by Ye Galleon, the State Library holds about 420. The YGP collection represents the work of the press as a whole, but additional copies of those titles related to Pacific Northwest history are added to our circulating Northwest collection for the access and enjoyment of all. Glenn Adams was the recipient of the 1998 Nancy Blankenship Prior Award, which was awarded to those who made unique contributions to the literary culture of Washington State. Librarians at the State Library had a close working relationship with Adams prior to his death in 2003, and other collections contain correspondence between our librarians and Glenn on a variety of issues. Of particular note is Adams' publishing dispute with Guy Reed Ramsey, whose Eastern Washington Post Office histories languished until Mr. Ramsey passed away. This correspondence came to light after we began digitization of Ramsey's postmarked Washington research, which we hope will be released online in increments within the next year or so. Here we see Americana, Ye Galleon Press number one, was published in 1940 and very appropriately both written and printed by Glenn Adams. It is a small hardbound volume of poetry and it's possible this might have been a gift from Glenn to the State Library. Here you can see the notation that our first edition copy is number 64 out of 500 copies. Adams also re often reserved room at the back of his books for a colophon, comments about the printing process, and it appears this was true from the very beginning. Here we see his note <clears throat> on page 29 about the font and printing process that created his first work. I selected this later Ye Galleon title somewhat at random, but mostly because of the wonderful colors on the cover that have been preserved in this hardbound copy of the Wenatchee Indians. Guardians of the Valley by Richard Scheuermann. It was title number 287, printed by E. Galleon, according to the colophon. This title is interesting because it was produced in part by grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and Washington Educational Service District number 171. Kashmir Public Schools holds the copyright for this title and a logo for Kashmir Public Schools appears on the back cover. Undoubtedly, this title circulated for quite a while for, for quite a number of years as both a school textbook and a regional history. This wonderful color colophon contains Glenn's signature statement about printing, which appeared on many Egalian titles. Quote, this was a fun project. We had no special difficulty with the work. I appreciate the memoirs and, er and local histories published by Egalian the most, including this title, Crosscut Saw Reflections in the Pacific Northwest, written by Jim Deaton and published in 1998. It's a bit difficult to tell from this image, but it is a paperback. This is a late title for Yee Galleon and Glenn Adams, who would continue running his press until his death until in 2003. Here you can see our copy is signed by the author. This title does not include the colophon that was included in so many early titles. The State Library does want to collect and celebrate books published by our region's small presses. These lovingly created items are often created in small batches and feature the work of poets. If you're aware of a small press that is producing items related to the Pacific Northwest that you think we should know about, I hope you will shoot me an email and let me know. Presently, items from Brooding Heron Press, Broken Moon Press, Copper Canyon Press, Jawbone Press, and Blue Cactus Press are represented in our collection and I thought I would showcase just a few of them here for you. This little volume of the cutout cover is Walking to Ozette by Marilyn Crosetto and published by Waterland Press. The beautiful title page and the tipped in artwork on the facing page. And here you can see the hand sewn binding and the deckled edge. It's just a little gem of a book. 
Here we have an example from East Point Press located in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It was printed on an 1888 vintage pearl letter press. You see we were fortunate enough to obtain a signed copy. And here's just an example of the poetry and illustrations that appear in that volume. Finally is an example from Copper Canyon Press, Journal of the Sun by James Masao Mitsui. I just love the colors on the cover and the leather binding of the spine. It's just absolutely unique. 26 copies were hand bound by Annie and John Hansen and the State Library's signed copy is designated letter B, which must be the second of the 26. It's hard to select just one of the poems to highlight. And unfortunately, I won't have time to like let you read the entire thing. But if you are watching this on playback, feel free to pause it and, and read this lovely little poem here. It may be a little unexpected, but I want to take some time to discuss our government publications collections as repositories of rare, unique, and unexpected print materials. The State Library preserves many types of government publications, but the two I want to highlight today are the federal government publications produced by the Executive Branch and Congress and distributed through the Government Printing Office, GPO, and our state government publications, which preserve reports and documents created by Washington State agencies and the legislature. Often these works are overlooked during discussions of rare books, but I want to highlight them because in the course of my nearly 20 years at the State Library, I've seen far too many outstanding examples that deserve to be seen by a wider audience. I'll start with some federal publications. In the interest of time, I wanna focus on one example in particular. Before we get to it, I'll share the these photos of some congressional hearings that appear in our collections. On the left, hearings on the munitions industry dating from 1935, and on the right, the Congressional Investigation into the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Here's the main example I'd like to focus on, which is the U.S. Congressional Serial Set, which collects some of the earliest and most important documents published by the federal government. The Serial Set began in 1817 with the 15th Congress, and even though Washington didn't become a territory until 1853, we do have Serial Set volumes in the collection that predate that likely because of the diligence of Stevens and other territorial librarians who thought it important to obtain as complete a set as possible. Here you can see these gorgeous early examples bound in calfskin. Digitization of this massive collection has been undertaken by a variety of organizations over the years, but using this collection is difficult because of the randomness of each volume. You can see that each item has an individual sequential number pasted on in white. However, within each volume, the reports are published as received, meaning that a report on the U.S. military and pre presence in Cuba could be immediately followed by a report on agriculture or race relations. It's very random. These reports can even date from different years. So while keyword searching may be possible for individual volumes, a good index is critical in being able to use this collection optimally. In my own experience with this collection, I would consider this an advanced tool that uh, takes practice and patience to use, but can pay off in marvelous ways. Volumes contain beautiful maps and charts and cover topics of great interest. Given the valuable content, these items are at high risk for theft and destruction due to them being broken up into com component pieces. Please be on the lookout for library property or discard stamps and make sure to confirm the provenance of any document that purports to come from serial set volumes. I've chosen three examples of items I've seen in the serial set, uh, thanks to our customers in the last several years. The first is a report of the Secretary of War transmitting information about Colonel George Wright's campaign against the Coeur d'Alene, Yakima, Palouse, and Spokane warriors in the aftermath of the Battle of Pine Creek in 1858. The real value in this report, I don't think, is in, in the documentation of the military's activities, but the highly detailed cartographic mapping that was completed by Lieutenant John Mullen of later Mullen Road fame. Here you can see mileages between waypoints, including the distance between New Fort Walla Walla and Old Fort Walla Walla, uh, 29.4 miles. And here you can see an accompanying map showing the plan of Colonel Steptoe's battlefield on Ingossaman Creek, or as it's now called Pine Creek, in May 1858, created under the direction of Mullen. 
This is an enlargement of that map showing the first point of attack and the first position of the Howitz, howitzers, which Mullen was tasked with recovering during his survey, along with any bodies from the, bo from the uh, battle. Here's a more recent example from the serial set. Again, a letter from the Secretary of War, but this time dated 1943. Again, the value in this report is the detailed survey of, a, of the Skokomish River, which contains wonderful detail and a history of a river that was, at that point, only 20 years removed from two dams being, blocking what was once one of the largest and most productive salmon producing rivers on Hood Canal. Finally, this last example from the serial set brought to light an event in American history that I was ashamed to know nothing about. The Brownsville Affray or Brownsville Affair has a name meant to minimize the event in which black soldiers stationed at Fort Brown, Texas in 1906 were framed by white residents of Brownsville for the murder of a white bartender and the wounding of a police officer. Despite the fact that all the black soldiers of the 25th Regiment were confined to their barracks the night that night and incapable of committing the crime, evidence was planted against the men. As a result of this investigation, President Theodore Roosevelt ordered the discharge without honor of 167 soldiers. The men of the 25th Regiment were not cleared until the 1970s, at which point only one man still survived. These hearings take up several volumes of the serial set and can just contain just amazing amount of information. Here you can see the introduction to this section, which contained testimonies to the type of bullets used and planted at the crime scene. Secretary of War William Howard Taft submitted the written evidence. But there was also a hearing and a complete transcript is included. Question, could those shells with those bullets have been used in a crag? Answer, no, sir. Question, why not? Answer, because the shell is too large to enter the chamber of the crag rifle and have the bolt locked into the firing position. This diagram of forensic evidence was also submitted showing scoring on recovered cartridge, cartridge cases. Reading this material makes the eventual cover-up of the U.S. government and white citizens all that more horrifying, given the large amount of physical evidence they had. On the other side of government publications is the state government publications. By law, the Washington State Library serves as the official depository for state agency publications. That means any publication created by the state's government is required to be deposited with us for preservation and access. And I'm just gonna pause really quick. I see a countdown of 46 seconds. I'm just confirming that I'm not gonna get cut off in 41 seconds. Uh, you, you, will should. Not. you will not. Okay, I will keep going then. <laughs> yes, please do. All right. Um, collecting the area of state government predates even the depository, though. And we have quite a number of old and interesting reports. Take, for example, this report on teachers' cottages in Washington, put out by the State Department of Education in 1915. The report emphasizes the importance of maintaining a comfortable and safe residence for rural teachers as a matter of teacher retention. It contains photos of examples of teachers' cottages, good and bad and actually profile some of the teachers and their experiences by name. In this photo, you can see Anacortes teacher, the Anacortes teacher's cottage that was occupied by Robert DeWar and family. Another cool thing the bulletin includes is actual building plans for constructing your own teacher's cottage. Ideal designs for single teachers, teachers with families, and more than one teacher are all included. So time is running out, but I want to hi highlight one other state publication, which is How to Use the Grand Coulee Dam, prepared by the Columbia Basin Commission sometime during the 1930s. Um, as you can see, the, the reason I selected this one is just the marvelous illustrations here. Uh, but despite the title, this report is really more aspirational rather than instructional. The reason I say this is that the report not only includes plans for festivals, rodeos, and fairs of uh, of the future, but also includes plans for a giant information bureau that functioned as a statewide visitor center and a giant viewing tower on Crown Point, neither of which was ever constructed. The tower is dubbed the Washington State Building and is designed in an Art Deco style popular in the 1930s. 
Oddly, the plans called for the 100-foot tower to be constructed out of aluminum and have a giant beacon attached, which would light up at night and be, quote, visible for many miles from all directions. The commission even consulted with the chief lighting engineer at Westinghouse about this feature, and he claimed it would be the most stupendous electrical illumination the world has ever seen. If you have doubts about the feasibility of the plan, a list of reasons for the tower is included, which you can see here. Those reasons include, quote, it will be spectacular and the lighting program will be highly attractive. Clearly not enough people were made aware of this brochure because our staff has never seen another reference to this tower in any of the other materials about the construction of Grand Coulee, making this item very rare indeed. Um, with that, I'm going to bring it to a close our tour of, of the items in our collection. Uh, there's so many more I wish I had time to demonstrate, but uh, again, we're running short on time. I hope I've made it clear that we're first and foremost a library. All of the materials I've highlighted today are available to be re reviewed on site at our location in Tumwater. Many of the materials I've shown have additional copies available in the circulating Northwest collection, which means you can check the title out of our library directly or through interlibrary loan. Another good portion of our older materials have been digitized because they are now considered uh, fair use under copyright law. As far as viewing the physical items, all of our rare collection items are shelved in secured compact shelving stacks and are generally unavailable for browsing unless you're taking a tour with me or one of our other librarians. However, everything I've highlighted here is listed in our online catalog and can be pulled ahead for a visit. I encourage you to search our online catalog and make your own discoveries. There's so much to find there. If you're interested in viewing one or more items, just let us know ahead of time and we can have them waiting for you when you arrive. The photo you see on this slide is of our special collections desk, complete with a photo stand on the left and a high-end magnifier on the right for those with visual uh, limitations or people who just want a closer look. Anyone using a book from our territorial, rare, or other special collection must use those materials at this desk, which is adjacent to our reference desk where the librarian on duty is available if you need help or assistance. Our staff can make a limited number of electronic scans or copies depending on the fragility or stability of an item, available equipment and staff time, and of course, copyright clearance if applicable. If you'd like to view any of the sources for the topics I discussed today, I did put, put together this short bibliography. I will um, especially recommend Hazel Mills article, Isaac Stevens in the Washington Territorial Library. The research she did was really quite incredible. Um, but I want to be you to be able to copy this information down. So I'll leave this screen up for a little while and we can start taking any questions if there are any. Uh, Gary, do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so there was a couple of questions that came in through the chat. Okay. Um, one of which was, who were the Seattle girls? Um, it's one of the small little fundraising groups that cropped up during World War I. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure who they were. Um, I suspect that they were connected with the University of Washington in some way, perhaps students. Um, they were the organizers of that particular event, the fundraiser for in 1918. Great. Um, and then there was another question uh, or comment, and maybe both. Um, I've tried to find a copy of Preston's report on the teacher's examination in 1910. I once saw it on, on Internet Archive, but could not find it again. I suspect you have it. Okay. Um, for anyone who has a question like this, and I suspect that there are probably more than just this one out there, you're welcome to send us an email through our Ask a Librarian service, and we will do the research and get back to you. Um, it's not something I can uh, you know, answer off the top of my head, unfortunately, but um, we can take a look and see. We do have a lot of um, teacher examination materials from around the turn of the century. Um, publishing the, the tests was a very common thing to do. Sometimes those things even appeared in newspapers. Um, here's the exam that our students will be taking to get their teacher's license. Um, so it would not surprise me if we had something like that. But um, yeah, so shoot us an email through Ask a Librarian and either I or one of my coworkers will, will do the research and get back to you.
I'm going to stop sharing here so I can see the chat and hopefully respond a little better. Actually, before I do that, I will I will put up my contact information. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was I was trying to say something, Mary, and oh, I sure. was I was muted. So I'm I was delighted to see the um, the article about uh, Isaac uh, uh, Stevens because that was going to be my first question: is how do we find out more information about him? He seems like he's worth a book. Oh, um, yes, he he is, and he has been. There are several very good books about him. Um, I mentioned his book, his biography that his son wrote about him, Hazard Stevens. Um, but there's been more contemporary ones who kind of put his, um, especially his Indian treaty activities into context, um, which it's, it's a very difficult story. Um, yeah. but that article that Hazel wrote, um, about his relationship to the territorial library, I think is really wonderful. She did a ton of work on it and and um, she, in the back, she's got lists. That's where I pulled all those prices from. Um, she gathered together, you know, the the information from the NARA film and the and the and the items themselves and and told us what each item was that he paid for, which is really difficult because if I look when I look at the film, I find that handwriting very difficult to to uh, mm -hmm. make out. So good yeah. for her. <laughs> um I want to thank you, Mary. That was just a terrific uh, talk. Um, the I uh, I knew uh, virtually well. I knew nothing, frankly. I am embarrassed to say about our state library, and um, I now know um, a thousand times as much as I did before. And I'm grateful for that knowledge. And I look forward to uh, to a trip down there. Maybe maybe. Um, uh, Someday we can have uh, we we talked about having you know this be an in person um, event, but you know frankly we can reach such a larger uh, our audience doing this on Zoom, and um, I think we'll have to we can make our own um, journeys down there to uh, Tumwater and uh, see the uh, the building and the uh, and the library. Yeah, um, absolutely. We're happy to like I said, we do do tours for people who are interested and uh, those folks who want to to look specifically at um, individual items that I've highlighted here, mm -hmm. just let us know. And we can, like I said, we can pull those ahead of time and, and have them available for you uh, to look at. And I'm sure you have a catalog of things um, or how do you access your, uh, you know, your, your, the holdings? Yeah. So on our website, um, which is sos.wa.gov forward slash library. On the front page, there is a link to our to search our online catalog, and everything that I've mentioned today is is cataloged in that in mm -hmm. that tool. So you can search it. You can. Um, what I would recommend is you know find find an item or or two that you're interested in, and then mm -hmm. use those subject headings that appear further down in the catalog record to browse similar items. Um, you might find more that way than just doing a keyword search. Right. So how much is the, um, how much of it has been digitized? Um, that's kind of a hundred thousand dollar question, isn't it? I mean, everyone yes. would really love to have everything we have digitized. Um, digitization is wonderful and marvelous and puts these materials into the hands of people who otherwise wouldn't be able to get to them. Um, digitization is also very time consuming and expensive um, to, if you're going to do it right. Um, and you also have to consider the cost of hosting the digitized item. So that software storage fee um, as well. I, I can't really estimate how much of the collection is digitized. Uh, if I had to, I would say it's a small fraction, um, even see. with the progress we've made. Um, mm -hmm. Those of you who are interested, I would recommend checking out um, Washington Digital Newspapers, which is um, our, our digitization branch focusing on old Washington newspapers. Sean Schulmeyer, our newspaper, uh, digital newspapers librarian, uh, has done an amazing job. More newspapers are appearing all the time on that site. Um, and I always tell people, look, even with newspapers, it costs eight cents a page for us to put a digitized newspaper up. Um, and, you know, newspapers are hundreds of pages. So you guys can do the math on that. Um, right. It's, you know, all libraries right. would love to have a robust digitization program. And we are no exception. We would love to do that. Um, we will scan items on demand if we 
if they are small enough that we can do that and we have the staff time available, just just let us know. Right. And the, do you still have, an, uh, I take it, an active acquisitions program? Are you still, maybe, let me put that in two questions. One is historical material, still trying to fill gaps. Um, and then uh, as far as current publications are concerned, I guess you do the Governor's Award. Uh, those those are, that's a kind of an ongoing collection that is continually updated. Uh, but can you tell me a little bit about, or tell us a little about your, your the acquisitions program? Sure. Um, so it's a little bit complicated because right now our special collections librarian position is currently vacant um, due to due to some budget constraints. We're hoping that we can rehire for that position in the very near future. Um, so currently we're, we have not been purchasing in the area of rare books for the last year or so. Um, right. I purchased for the Northwest collection. All of those materials circulate or are available elsewhere. Um, I do keep an eye out for reprints of historical items that we can include. Um, so, and, and of course we, we do collect, we do, we do have donations from time to time. Sometimes mm -hmm. we get approached by people who are like, I have this rare item. Would you guys be interested in it? Um, you know, we can always have those conversations. Um, currently our, our rare books purchasing is, is paused. Um, and I don't see that lasting too much terribly longer, but um, it is for now. Um, and again, we always appreciate tips too. Like if you guys see something and go, ooh, State Library should be made, made aware of this, please drop us a line and let us know. Right. Um, we really appreciate that. At least I appreciate it as someone who purchases for our collections. Right. Tim, you raised your hand. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Robert had a question. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Mary, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Oh, um, I've enjoyed it. And uh, um, I'm someone who uh, haunts uh, libraries and archives for research into Northwest print culture, especially the more obscure publications mm -hmm. um, by marginalized groups, uh, ethnic minorities, such as Native people, Indigenous people of, of the Northwest. And I'm wondering... How well cataloged uh, are those items that might have been deemed ephemera and maybe not worthy of being cataloged? It might not show up on your online presence. Um, but basically, you know, are there discoveries to be made in folders that are very broadly lumped Indians or something like that from the past? Just wondering about your, your assessment about, you know, could there be hidden gems there still? Yes. Um, Thank you. We do have a um, a vertical file crammed full of of old folders, um, which I know ephemera people love. We um, we're actually the Secretary of State's Legacy Washington program is housed in our building, and um, writer John Hughes, former editor of the Aberdeen Daily World, loves that vertical file collection because it is full of ephemera. Um, we have uh, surveyed that collection. It's in four or five, I can't remember the number, four or five large, uh, you know, uh, cabinets. Um, we've surveyed that collection several times to make sure there's no like significant thing that we can catalog and put into the collection instead. Um, so the remainder of stuff that's in that are like copies and pieces of paper and other random things. Um, sometimes you can run across a little gem in there. Um, I know I have. Um, but it's, it hasn't been added to, I, I always think of like our ephemera collection is something that was kind of put out of business by the internet, because there's nothing that the internet does better than collect ephemera, um, especially if you uh, make use of something like um, uh, the Wayback Machine, uh, the internet archive and that sort of thing. Um, so we also have... Um, clippings files from newspapers. Um, those clippings files are arranged by subject matter as well. Um, newspaper clippings are kind of their own separate beast. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, in terms of digitization projects, that would be a marvelous thing to, to put up online for people. It would also be an enormous undertaking because we have um, basically two rows of compact shelving filled with bo archival boxes full of newspaper clippings. Um, it's an absolutely enormous collection. 
Um, and sometimes those newspaper clippings are great because they appear in front from newspapers that have not been digitized yet and are only available on microfilm. I hope that helps, Robert. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sorry, I just had one. I had one comment. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you, Mary, very much again for um, taking the time to give this presentation um, today. Very thoughtful and interesting. Um, just on a practical level, what days of the week is the Washington State Library uh, open to the public? I think it's Monday through Friday. Is that correct? It's actually Tuesday through Friday currently. Tuesday through Friday. Um, yeah. Um, again, this we are hoping to reinstate that Monday open for business because Tuesday mornings, all of a sudden we realize we're very busy on Tuesday mornings. Everyone holding their research questions and research uh, until the first time we're open. Um, so Tuesday through Friday, um, 10 a.m. is when we open. Um, our lobby closes at four, but if you're hanging out doing research in our reading room, um, we'll let you stay until closer to five o'clock. Um, we won't boot you out until our staff really needs to go home. <laughs> well, I've been meaning to visit in the last couple of months since I first made contact with you, but because of my work schedule, I uh, I haven't uh, had the time. But I realize Friday of next week is actually an in-service day at my uh -huh. school, so I'm hoping to make it over to Tumwater maybe Friday morning. Awesome. Yeah, just just shoot us. We, we also have an appointment system on our on our page, so if you would you can either use our appointment system, which is a little bit clunky, or you can send an email through Ask a Librarian, both get to us and, and you know, notify the correct people that you will be coming. Thank you. Um, Shirley, you had a question about Ask a Librarian. Um, we had some misinformation that accidentally got published about our uh, Ask a Librarian service. Our email Ask a Librarian service is, is, is still there. Um, the one thing that we stopped doing with these budget cuts was monitoring our chat service. So we used to have an online chat service that a librarian would type back to you in real time. That's the only thing that's been suspended currently. Um, email, ask a librarian, in person, telephone, all of that. We're still here. We're still answering questions. But thanks for thanks for asking that question because it's a little bit difficult to correct that <laughs> the correct information like that once it's out in the world. Thanks, Mary. That that was my confusion. I did read that uh, other announcement. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I also see a question about um, the Tweeny project, the Tweeny 89 project. Um, Catherine Hamilton Wang is the expert on that project, but and she did a ton of work. Um, George, I believe his name is George Tweeny, uh -huh. um, yeah. came out for the centennial of Washington state with a list of the most important books um, for Washington. Uh, Catherine's gonna have to help me out here. Um, but she wrote an entire article about the Tweeny 89 project that appeared in the, um, in the book club's journal. Um, and it did appear on that list of uh, resources that I, that I put out uh, at the end of my slides. So uh, you're welcome to read up on it. It's, it's a fascinating project. Um, again, something else that we can be adding to as we go on. Um, but it's basically a survey of the most important books for our state um, as we approached our centennial. Yeah, that, if I could just make a, a little plug for the book club is the George Twinney's book was published by the Book Club of Washington in a, in a fine edition and then in a more standard edition also a very nice edition. I'm not sure we have any available in stock for sale, but they can be obtained um, online. So it's a wonderful, uh, a beautifully produced uh, book uh, by a uh, um, uh, by a wonderful uh, 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 dealer. Okay, well, um, I think that's. I think that'll that'll do it for 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 Sunday. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, sign off right now and uh, say goodbye to everybody. It was just a, a terrific afternoon, Mary. Uh, th thanks again. Thank you so much for okay. inviting me, and uh, I look forward to seeing some of you in the near future. Come yeah. down and visit us sometime. We'd really enjoy that. Well, we I, you'll, we'll haunt you, no doubt. Okay, yes, good. Down. Okay. Uh, and uh, and we'll be in touch, Mary, about maybe an article, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Mull it over and see what you think. Yeah, okay, great. All right. Thanks again. Take Bye -bye. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.